I was interested in cities. I had to go to Los Angeles to understand American cities. It was, it was, that was very clear to me much earlier in my career. <clears throat> so I spent a long time trying to understand it. And along the way, I, I actually understood that Los Angeles is a border city. The only way to understand Los Angeles is to go to Mexico. And so I, I looked south for a lot of explanations about the way Los Angeles worked. At some point along the way, Mexico and the borderland especially became an object of study in its own right for me. It became intrinsically interesting and my curiosity was fired. Um, I therefore thought uh, around 2000, 2001, that I really ought to spend the time in uh, exploring the border along its entire length on both sides. And I, it's true to say that that journey actually changed my life. We split the border trip up into several sections. And so that what was supposed to be a drive along the border back and forth turned out to be a three-year journey. Mainly, it was always by car, sometimes on foot, sometimes in a border patrol vehicle. That wasn't actually planned, those trips, but that happened too. When you look at media coverage of the border, the old journalistic adage, is if it bleeds, it leads. And of course, that's true. Um, so that you've got all the headlines in the television, in newspapers, et cetera, et cetera, online, are basically talking about the bloodletting at the border. My approach is different. I would rather actually, based on my now 10 years experience of these communities, I would rather tell the good news story about the border, about the way the communities coexist with each other, about how before the war, people on one side would cross to the other side on a Sunday to play a game of softball, have a barbecue, and then go back later in the evening. It's that the special communities that are on both sides of the border, they're joint communities, they're linked communities, that give the border its special identity. And I think we too often forget how important those communities are to our economic and social well-being because we are obsessed by how many migrants are crossing or not crossing. And we're obsessed by, too, the, the problems of the drug wars. I don't mean to suggest for one moment these are not reasonable concerns. The immigration issue is an issue. It's an issue that we've manufactured. Well, I call this place, these, these borderland communities, the third nation, because they reside within a, in a place which is between two nations. It's the in-between space. And I, the way I like to think about that is that from the border itself, the line with the monuments and all the other markers of geopolitical divide, uh, we spread out from that wall to communities, to regions, to major metropolises like Los Angeles and Monterrey in Nuevo León on the Mexican side. And between those major cities, there are whole sections of both nations which are identifiable as something separate. It's the in-between spaces, which I call the third nation, which is also buttressed by the fact that there's a, there's a really serious consciousness amongst people who live there about being in a different place. They don't call it a third nation, but they call themselves very often trans-border citizens as some indication of the people's own consciousness about the, the, the fact that they live in a different place. When we talk about the third nation and the identities of the communities that live along the line, it's often been said to me that we can move the international boundary line 20 miles north and nobody would actually notice it. Life would go on pretty well, thank you very much. In the old days, in the early 2000s, you, there was no border fencing at all. And the fence wasn't marked in a large number of places. It was very easy to cross the border accidentally. After 9-11, the formation of the Department of uh, Homeland Security and the Secure Borders Act, uh, that authorized the building of the wall on a grand scale. In fact, involved completing the wall along the entire land boundary. The river boundary, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, is a different matter. Some walls were built there, but more often there, it's more technological surveillance than actually walls. In financial terms, the major beneficiaries have been all those industries that are connected with security along the border, what I call the border industrial complex. And I'm including there the people like Boeing, who build the walls. I'm including the, correct, uh, the Corrections Corporation of America, who have built all the private prisons that now extend along the border in a kind of a gulag that we have built 
and were used to detain migrants prior to prosecution and prior to deportation. It's that broad industrial complex, including those people who actually built the wall, where billions of dollars have been sunk in the past five years. Those that have been the major beneficiaries uh, of all that effort. My real worry is that the border industrial complex would be so interested in maintaining the security apparatus, maintaining the tension at the border, that they will push to maintain that apparatus irrespective of what immigration reform may or may not be undertaken in this country. The most amusing part of the journey in some ways is seeing where the uh, intentions of securing the border were complete failures or complete erratics. I mean, in, in Texas, for example, where uh, Texas is very big, um, in Texas, for example, almost all the land is privately owned. And so consequently, the record of building the wall in Texas is, is extremely rich because of so much litigation and lawsuit that came along with that. Now, that didn't stop the D Department of Homeland Security from building the walls. In fact, the DHS waived at least 50 environmental laws so that they could go ahead and build the wall. Now, what did they do? They cut properties in half when it suited them. So there's one university in Texas uh, where the wall runs through the campus. One half is south of the, of the wall, the other half is north of the wall. In other places where these rather deep meanders of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, actually exist, they built the walls across the top of the meander. So all the land to the south in the meander is now uncertain territory. And people have said to me there, do we live in Mexico now, or do we still live in the United States? There's an argument going around Mexico right now that it's a narco state. It's a, it's a, it's a state that, in some places at least, is dominated by the cartels. And it's a good argument. Um, it, it's a very volatile situation, and it changes almost month to month. But if you, if you imagine, and I am asking you to imagine now, if you imagine the situation where the cartels dominate the area south of the border, and the border industrial complex dominates the area north of the border, it's going to be interest, in the interest of both those agencies to make an alliance, a pact, that guarantees the well-being of both of them irrespective of what's happening in the communities along the border. This is the real threat to the third nation. The ostensible reason for the war was to stop undocumented migration, which by all measures was basically out of control. Um, it didn't. <clears throat> the wall is often claimed for the present day situation, whereby the number of undocumented migrants into the United States has dropped off dramatically. Um, but in point of fact, the, the peak of migration by undocumented people into this country occurred in 2007. This is before the war was completed. So the trend was already downward then. Um, the war came along, and of course the war is supposed to have stopped people. But I'll guarantee you that people know any number of ways around, over, under, and through the war. They will get through, and they'll get around, they'll get over if they want to. It's more difficult now. It slowed them down. But they're, and in fact, a lot of the people in the federal government who are the Department of Homeland Security who really like the war basically are now saying it was never intended to stop migration. It was intended solely to slow migrants down so that they could be apprehended more easily. In that regard, the war has failed. The simple fact of the matter is that on a global scale, wars are an admission of failure in geopolitics a failure in international relations. Because you can't figure out a diplomatic solution, you build a wall. It's, it's nonsensical. Walls always come down. The wall is a historical aberration. The wall has never been there before, and it's going to go away soon. At the same time, you understand, while we're building walls and trying to stop people from coming in, we're building more and more ports of entry in the wall. We are building gaps in the wall while we are building the wall to seal people out. There is so much trade and so much connection between the two sides that we can't stop it. Moreover, we don't want to stop it because the wall actually jeopardizes the prosperity and growth in the region. What's more important in some ways, and, and, the, and the question which underlies this all for me, I think, is what should we do with the war? We should take it down, but we should also preserve sections of it. 
we should preserve sections of it to remind ourselves of a period in the early 21st century when the United States lost its moral compass. And maybe we can use those commemorative sections of the war to remind us about who we are, what this country is, and how immigrants have been so important in the lives of this country and building this country into what it is today. <laughs>